guys, Tommy Laren here. Thanks for spending some quality time with me tonight. Let's get down to business and clear some smoke, or should I say vape? Yeah, apparently Americans are all about Mary Jane, but when it comes to tobacco, it's a public health concern. Time to call a spade a spade. What's the deal with e-cigs? I'll get you on point. Then who is the man everyone wants to stick it to? When it comes to bosses, the unions know of what they speak. Why? Because they are just as bad. So is it your right to work or the union's right to take? Cross the picket line and let's tell it like it is. Still ahead, hate the player or hate the game? Young people have Tinder and old people have Ashley Madison. Whether you're swiping to the left or to the right, the industry is worth billions. Someone is lining their pockets and profiting from cheating. Get all hot and bothered with me later. Next, what about paid parental leave? Should women get paid maternity leave? What about gays? Get on point with baby vacation. Time to man up? We'll see. But first, BB is coming to town and some people, <coughs> Democrats, aren't very welcoming. Yeah, a growing number of our blue friends are going to boycott the speech. And oh no, the White House is pouting too because House Speaker John Boehner didn't consult his majesty before the invite. Is consistent with longstanding practice for uh, the leader of a foreign government when they're planning to visit the United States to contact and coordinate that visit with the leader of the United States. Uh, and so, you know, the invitation that was extended and the acceptance of that invitation did represent a departure from protocol. Uh, but ultimately, it's the responsibility of the Speaker of the House uh, to make uh, decisions about the floor schedule of the House of Representatives. I've invited uh, Prime Minister of Israel, but, uh, Benjamin uh, Netanyahu, uh, to address a joint session of Congress on the grave uh, threats of uh, radical Islam and uh, the threat that Iran poses. It's not only the Middle East, but frankly, to the world. Wait, wait, wait. I'm waving the BS flag here. Hypocrites, much? Mr. Obama, you have no problem circumventing Congress at every turn, but now you're mad when protocol isn't followed? Ah, it hurts, don't it? But back to business. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu isn't coming for the fun of it. No, he has a big problem with diplomatic plans to cuddle Iran. President Obama vowed to veto any new sanctions over their nuclear ambitions. Do you expect Congress to sit idly by while you cut a bad deal with Iran? Boehner's response? Two words. Hell no. Returning to the On Point bullpen is international relations expert Philippe Azeline. Thank you so much, Philippe, for being with me again. Thanks for having me again. So, Philippe, we know how Boehner feels. We know how Dems feel. How do the Israelis feel about this invite? I think there's mixed emotions. Um, there's definitely fear, and people are trying to cling to anything that could be a solution. Iranian nukes would be a disaster for Israel. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been presenting it as an existential threat for years now. So any sense that he could change the situation by speaking to Congress is something that a lot of people want to cling to. On the other hand, Israelis are very, very sensitive to the relationship with America. Uh, Israelis do believe in American exceptionalism very much. And anything that seems to threaten that relationship is not going to play well at home. One of the criticisms I've heard from the White House and from Democrats is that him speaking to a joint session of Congress outside of the protocol of President Obama inviting him would be somehow sway the Israeli elections. Do you think that plays a part in this, or is that just um, political posturing again on the part of the White House? I think you can never eliminate the issue of elections, unfortunately. Uh, there's a saying that in Israel there's no foreign policy, there's only domestic policy. So um, it, there is a chance that some of this is politicized, that the prime minister in Israel is banking on him um, benefiting uh, in the polls. It's a very tight race uh, so far. Not that I think he's not sincere in his concern about Iranian bombs, but I do think it, it probably does play some role in it. Why do you think that the Democrats are upset about it? They say, as I mentioned before, that it's because protocol wasn't followed. But come on, protocol is often not followed. We see President Obama circumvent Congress on numerous occasions. Some of them are even planning to boycott the speech. Does this really show where our loyalties lie? We've always been allies with Israel, and now people are going to sit out of the speech. What message does that send? So this, I think, is the real threat of this whole incident. Apparently, first of all, protocol was followed. And this is a 
controversy manufactured by the White House. Uh, maybe they want to hurt BB domestically. Maybe they want to change the subject. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I lost my track of thought, Tommy. I'm sorry. That's all right, Philippe. We were talking about the Democrats and uh, sitting out of the speech. Right. What so, message that sends? What message does that send to, to Israel? Where our loyalties lie? Does it show that we are not supporting them the way we always have in the past? So, right. So, thank you. I was going back to, to that threat. Israel's being made into a wedge issue. And President Obama has probably forced Democratic congressmen who would have supported sanctions and who support Israel to choose between faithfulness to this White House and that position. And so far, it's not going very well for Israel because we see Democratic congressmen who are saying they will boycott the speech or no longer support sanctions. The bill has been shelved. This is a very uh, concerning development. And I think that would also have an impact on how Israelis view this. I think so, too. And that's the trouble here. But I don't know about you, Philippe. Maybe I'm taking this a little too far. But for me, I don't understand why President Obama is cuddling up to Iran the way that he is. He says it's because he doesn't want to compromise diplomatic talks. But at the end of the day, I just don't see, I just don't understand why we're so close to Iran all of a sudden. Uh, do you have any speculation for that, uh, especially on the part of President Obama and his very public comments about uh, rejecting further sanctions? Yeah, um, so the general consensus recently seems to be that he's looking for legacy. Having failed to bring any kind of peace or agreement between Israelis and Palestinians, he is now trying to look for something that he can mark as a foreign policy success. And essentially, he'd be punting, kicking the ball down the road. It's possible that Obama doesn't see Iran as as big a threat to America than it is to Israel, which would be reasonable, except that on the long term, it is as much of a threat to America because Iran is not just the state of Iran, but it supports all these terrorist groups around the planet. Um, essentially, I think legacy might be the issue. But you know and what, he, Philippe? Yeah. Here's something that I want to bring up. I want to get your reaction because this seems to be a pattern with President Obama. Now, I don't want to suggest that he doesn't support the United States or that he somehow supports terrorism because I don't think that that's the case. However, he's made a string of comments recently, and I want to turn to comments that President Obama made in an interview with Vox.com, and it's raising some eyebrows. Yes. So personally, it doesn't surprise me at all, but I want your take on it. Because Obama seems to think that terrorist attacks at the kosher supermarket in Paris were carried out by radical, uh, not carried out radical Islamists, but, quote, zealots who behead people or randomly shoot up a bunch of folks in a deli. Random, a bunch of folks. Uh, what do you think of those recent comments? I think they're highly offensive, uh, especially the way the White House and the State Department have defended them. Uh, Josh Ernest and Jim Psaki have done, uh, it, w it was almost comical and absurd. On the one hand, the president has a policy of not naming the problem, Islamist extremism or Islamic extremism. And on the other hand, he won't even admit now, apparently, that this movement has a particular hatred for Jews and, and targets Jewish people, Jewish sites. Uh, the killer himself in Paris said he was targeting Jews. So it's surreal. Uh, I was listening to your monologue and the part about vape kind of uh, made me think about the recent uh, press conferences about this topic. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And the media doesn't seem to be picking up on it like they pick up on other little things. It's surprising to me because when you call uh, an attack like that on random folks in a deli, uh, that's a little interesting to me. This isn't the only instance I see of this. There are many examples. Another one uh, at the prayer breakfast. He had the, the guts to compare the Christian crusades to what ISIS is doing right now into radical Islam. When does this end? When do we start calling it what it is and being frank about these issues? I believe it starts at the White House. Uh, do you think we're going to see that anytime soon? Are we calling for that at all in the media? Um, not sufficiently. We're seeing more moral leadership on this issue in Egypt, in Gulf countries, in places where you'd least expect it than in the White House. Uh, there's a tendency to believe that if they just don't name it, the problem might go away, that if they do name it, then recruiting for ISIS will somehow increase as if people don't know that ISIS is presenting itself as an Islamic group. Um, I don't see enough pressure being put on the White House. If anything, since he's a, a lame duck or a sitting duck president now, it, it, there's almost a, an arrogance to it. It's, it. As Tom Friedman, of all people, said, we're entering the theater of the absurd. And this issue with the kosher deli, not even being able to 
give the comfort to the victims that at least we acknowledge that you were targeted because you were Jewish is, is uh, I think, a And Philippe, hubris. he didn't even say kosher. He said at a deli in Paris, random folks shooting up. I mean, the way that he referred to it, uh, to me, it doesn't seem like dignified office of the president. I understand everyone misspeaks from time to time, but he even clarified that. Uh, John Carl actually asked him, and he went on to further say and reiterate his point. To me, I don't know why the media isn't jumping all over it. It seems like it's our job. Uh, I'll take it as my job. But I want to turn back now to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in his speech yes. to Congress. Do you think that uh, he's going to sway on that at all uh, because of the outcry, because of what Democrats are saying? He's going to get any pushback and then possibly not make it uh, an open session? He's going to be more of a closed door, quiet type of thing? What do you think the chances are? There seems to be no indication that he's going to step back and cancel his speech. Uh, I'm not sure why. I'm not exactly sure what he wants to achieve. If he wants to speak directly to the American people, there may be less damaging ways. I mean, whether he's right or wrong, America does hold all the cards, and that means the president of the United States holds all the cards. So I'm not sure where he's going with this, but there seems to be no indication so far that he's going to step back. Why has this become such a partisan issue? In the past, Republicans and Democrats have come out in support of our long ties to Israel. Now, as you mentioned, it does seem to be a wedge issue. Are Democrats really becoming more anti-Israel? Is it starting at the office of the president? And why, on the other hand, are Republicans standing up and saying, enough is enough? I think this is a critical question, and I think, unfortunately, Israel is being made into a wedge issue by a number of factors. Uh, I think in this instance, the president had an interest in turning it into a wedge issue because he wants to lessen support for sanctions, and this was a convenient way to do it. And in a sense, BB walked into that trap. On the other hand, there's also been a campaign of propaganda against Israel that has been, for decades now, targeting the liberal or left-leaning sector of the American public. And we see in polls that young people who are liberal-leaning are losing support for Israel, even during wars against groups like Hamas, which are considered terrorist groups in the United States. Uh, this debacle around the speech is accelerating that trend, and it is very dangerous for Israel. And it is perhaps in the short term beneficial for the president, who has a hostile and unfriendly relationship with Netanyahu, uh, I think, in both directions, because it lessens support for the sanctions. The bill that was supposed to be proposed has been shelved for the time being. The supermajority that was being spoken about is no longer being spoken about. People may even boycott the speech. So being, making Israel wedge issue is working for him in the short term, and in the long term, I think it's a result of you very professional campaigns. Philippe, I think someone needs to put him on the spot and say, why, why are we cuddling up to Iran? And you know what? This girl right here is going to be the one to do it, and thank you for your help in doing so, Philippe. I, I don't want this luck. to be a wedge issue. We need to be concerned about a nuclear Iran. Let's call it what mm -hmm. it is. But thank you for shedding some light. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Coming up, put this in your pen and smoke it. Everything you wanted to know about e-cigs and vaping next. Keep it right here. So they tried to band together, but soon they understood that things weren't getting better. No big businessmen were working with the union, even though the industry and profits were a booming. Workers turned down and tried to walk out, but that was not what management was trying to be about. A fight for the right to end the urban plight and a struggle for that right the people would ignite. The poor and dejected would try to find unity, but realize the boss would never give them opportunity. Oh, unions. They used to be a lifeline for blue-collar workers, a way for the little guy to have a fighting chance against the man, an engine for upward movement and middle-class values. Well, babe, times have changed. Union bosses have now become the bullies they claim to battle. Unionization is often glorified for putting more money in workers' pockets. Well, here's my question. What good are higher wages and more benefits on the unemployment line? I'm all for workers' rights, but it's time to draw a line in the sand. Do unions do more harm than good? Let's ask labor policy reporter for The Daily Caller, Connor Wolf. Thank you for being with me, Connor, from our bureau in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for having me. Connor, let's start with Illinois. The governor is taking aim at big labor. Can you tell us a little bit about his executive order? 
Well, it's very interesting. About a month into office, and he's already shown a very um, adamant position in terms of labor. He had an executive order which makes um, union dues um, optional for most government workers in the state. Does that seem common sense to you? He's getting, uh, I mean, he's getting praise for it by some, but he's getting beaten up by others that are obviously pro-union. That, to me, makes sense. If you want to opt out of something and you don't want to pay dues, you shouldn't have to. Am I missing something here? I understand the controversy completely. It's, it's a very complex issue, and it gets a lot of people's emotions high. Uh, personally, though, I think that if you don't want to pay union dues, you shouldn't have to. And um, the governor didn't destroy unions. He didn't ban unions. He didn't do anything of that sort. He simply gave workers, government workers, an option. And, uh, and from what I believe, if you don't want to be a part of the union, if the unions aren't serving their purpose, the people are speaking, then we should listen to what the people want. That makes sense to me, but uh, then again, maybe I'm missing something. Do you think that there's a trend in this country for more states to move to right-to-work states to be um, less big labor? Uh, yes, there definitely is. Right now, we have 24 states that have their own version of a right-to-work law, um, meaning employees in that state can choose not to pay union dues if they don't want to. Uh, several other states are considering uh, measures. Uh, po union popularity, especially public sector union popularity, is going down. The trend in this country is definitely going a more worker freedom um, position, allowing workers to have a choice. That seems uh, American to me. So that moves to my next question about unions in general. Personally, Connor, do you think that unions have outlived their purp purpose in the United States? Well, yes and no. Uh, free association is such a very important part of uh, our culture and American values. If someone wants to join a union and they feel it's in their best interest to join a union, I certainly hope that right never gets taken away from them. I can think of a few industries where I would want union support, but having being forced into a union, mandatory union membership and mandatory union dues has never been okay. It's not that that aspect of unions is outgrowing its purpose. It's that there was never a moral purpose to force people into an organization. Let it be a purely a choice issue, and if they're offering a good service, people will come to them. And I think, too, that union bosses, from what I've seen, have become more like bullies. They have claim, as I mentioned in the opening here, they're supposed to be about fighting for the little guy, being a voice for blue-collar workers. But it seems to me more like the union bosses are starting to act more like CEOs. They want higher dues. They're bullying workers. They're bullying businesses. Am I completely off on this, or is this what you're seeing as well in, in states that are pushing for more right to work? The people seem to be speaking uh, with their feet. Yes, it's an incentive um, problem. If you're guaranteed a, uh, any economic group, a business, a labor union, a nonprofit, what have you, if there's no incentive, meaning you're just going to automatically get payment no matter what you do, then there's not an incentive to offer a good service. And um, for unions, there's not an incentive to represent their members in the best way possible. Um, you give workers the choice of whether to join a right. union or not join a union. The union will be mo more likely to um, actually provide their members with a good service so I that they so can too. keep their members. That's a, the free marketplace at work. But I want to turn it back now. We know that union membership is declining around the United States, but one thing I don't think is changing is its sway on our general elections. We know back in uh, 2012, President Obama got support from the labor unions. We know candidates oftentimes try to court uh, states that have a, a large labor population. Uh, we see Ohio all the time being a swing state for that reason a lot of the time. Are unions a partisan issue? Do they always fall along party lines? Uh, not always, but most of the time they do, and most of the time they support Democrats. And the election issue is very interesting because um, they're very important when it comes to election, and having union support, it goes a long way when you are seeking office, but I think this, um, the necessity of unions in elections have gone down a little bit, and it's not a deciding factor. It's just very good to have them in your corner. Look at Wisconsin, Scott Walker. They tried defeating him um, in a recall election and this mass, um, last midterm election because of his Act 10, which significantly reduced union power in the state. 
and they and Walker was still able to win every exactly. time. Exactly. And this shows that yes, they have lots of influence, but it's not a deciding factor when it comes to elections. What do you think of 2016, though, when we have the, the next Democrat probably going to be Hillary Clinton? Do you think she's going to actively court unions, in, especially in the swing states? Uh, I mentioned Ohio being one of them. Is that something that we're going to see, or is that fading out in, in uh, modern elections? Uh, if, if Hillary Clinton is smart, she will definitely cater to labor unions. Of course, there's going to be some disagreement on certain issues, as we know Obama. Um, he's a big union guy, but in terms of international trade and a few other issues, there's definitely disagreement. Um, I think the same thing will happen with Hillary. He'll, she'll support enough union issues that um, he'll, she'll be able to get uh, enough support. And um, unions, even if they don't like a candidate, they'll tend to pick a Democrat over a Republican simply because the Democrat is more likely to um, have their interests. And, and Connor, they do it in kind of backdoor ways, supporting unions. One of the things I see is the push to raise the minimum wage, have a federal minimum wage hike. What I see that as, uh, a lot of times workers, even I would call them low-informed voters, see raising the minimum wage as being, you know, it sounds great, more money, absolutely. Well, you know what that means? Why do the unions support it? Of course, then they can raise their union dues. But I think it's gonna put people out of work. Uh, we see, especially the, the fast food industry, them boycotting things, picketing. Um, they're gonna get replaced by technology if they're not careful. What's your take on that as far as uh, raising the minimum wage and how it relates to big labor? I agree with you. Uh, raising the minimum wage is not just a matter of giving um, low-wage workers more money. In a perfect world, that would sound wonderful, but it's a complex economic issue that must be thoroughly examined before we willy-nilly put 10 10 or $15 onto a vote. Um, what needs to be examined is its long-term and short-term economic impact, the stuff that you may not necessarily see right off the bat. And jobs are definitely a problem there. Uh, Low-skilled workers need experience to gain a lot of skills, and a lot of that experience comes in low-wage jobs. Um, young people just naturally don't have a lot of experience and don't have a lot of skills, so they need that first job at McDonald's or they need that first job somewhere where they're not making a lot of money, but they're making a long-term investment in themselves with skills and experience so that down the road they can get that nicer job. And get Connor, that I couldn't agree with you. I couldn't it, agree with you more. A lot of teenagers that start out at these jobs or workers that are that need a job, they're doing this. If you work hard at these jobs, it has been my personal experience and experience of many of my friends that if you work hard, you might actually get promoted up in the ranks to a management position or you gain the skills there. You have a job reference. You did a good job in high school working at McDonald's. You take that with you. You move up the ladder. You move to another job. It's the experience. And a lot of times unions, which are trying to support these movements to raise them in a wage, things of that nature, they're shielding the workers that, to me, why would they need shielding unless they're lazy? Why would they need shielding if they're, not, if they're gonna work hard, if they're gonna move themselves up the ladder? Don't tell me it's impossible. We see it every day. That's, again, my problem with unions. Do you think that, that there's any sense of that? My, my final question for you. Unions shielding workers that are not benefiting businesses? Uh, yes, that's, that's definitely uh, a concern, though this is an area I can't really blame unions for um, acting. Um, they, they're supposed to represent the members, and if they're um, members... Yes, Connor, um, but you're, you're supposed uh, to if, represent the members to get them to be treated fairly, not to get them to be able to sit around and not work hard or make poor work decisions. So to me, it's not that unions are bad, it's that we need to go back to their intended purpose, make sure that they're not abusive, make sure they're not bullying and hurting businesses, killing jobs. But it remains to be seen. We see it oh, declining. I agree with that. I, maybe, uh, maybe kind of we're moving to more of that kind of mentality. I would hope so, personal accountability. But we're running out of time. Thank you so much for being here and enlightening us on the issue. Still ahead, cheating just isn't like it used to be. Now all you need is a decent profile picture. It's shady, sketchy, and really profitable. My next guest went undercover on the adultery site, Ashley Madison. What did he find out? Keep it on point.
Well, we all know that sex sells, but so does cheating. How much? Well, Avid Life Media, which owns the adultery site Ashley Madison, Cougar Life, and a handful of others, grossed over $115 million last year, up 45% from 2013. Now, lovey-dovey, cutesy sites like Match.com are only up 5%. So if you're looking to make money hand over fist, cheating is the business to be in. Women pay nothing, but men spend about $250 a year for a membership. And want to wipe your profile from the site? $19 will do it. So what makes these sites so popular? Are we all just downright dirty dogs? Let's get an expert takes. Joining me now is relationship expert and best-selling author, Charles J. Orlando. Thank you for being with me, Charles. Thank you for having me. So Charles, you went undercover on Ashley Madison. What did you learn from that experience? <laughs> well, first I'll tell you, it's not for the faint of heart. So to anybody out there who's thinking they want to go on there undercover, my biggest advice is don't. Uh, it brings out all the cracks in your own relationship. I'm married, I have two kids, we've been together 25 years. Uh, it threw a bunch of curveballs at us that we didn't count on. Did I cheat? No. Uh, but the temptation was there, and you don't want to throw a temptation at your relationship. Uh, well, but are, Charles, are these sites in general throwing temptation? They're, they're up on the internet for anyone to access. Is that temptation enough? Oh, I think temptation is plenty. Uh, we can go back to MySpace or even today in Facebook. When you have so much access to people of the opposite, members of the opposite sex, and you have all this opportunity, Temptations all around us. It, it, nowhere else has it been more mentioned than in than in uh, divorce court, especially Facebook. I mean, you can go back in time and talk to someone from your high school days, your first high school sweetheart, and conjure up all those feelings that you thought were long dead, but maybe you're married with kids now, and that access didn't exist 10, 15, 20 years ago. Is it easing the access? So we all have an innate um, reaction to cheating that beforehand we just couldn't access it as easily, but now it's so much easier. Because to me, when you're talking about this, yeah, you can rekindle old romances. Maybe people in older generations couldn't do that before because of the limits of technology. So is it innate? Is it human nature to cheat? Well, you're, I think the question underneath that is, is monogamy natural? And monogamy and marriage are not necessarily natural things. Monogamy as a whole, when you look at us as human beings and you boil us down to our DNA, we're here for one purpose, and that is to perpetuate our species. So that means you want to have sex with as many people as possible. However, with the advent of marriage and commitment, it's not like that. But marriage as a whole was created originally as a combination of controlling sexually transmitted disease uh, for political gain between countries uh, or to guarantee sexual access for a man by a woman. So marriage has, has changed over the last few hundred years and now we're looking for people to take that committed step, but it's natural to be looking outside because we are human, but if we are a civilization and we are in fact civilized, then maybe it needs to oh. go for something more? Charles, I don't know how civilized we are. I want to turn back to the statistics too. 50% of women and 60% of men report to have affairs, but do men and women cheat for different reasons? You would know you went on the site. What do you think? They definitely do. So the most common reasons for men is a, a stroke to their ego, no pun intended. Uh, they also are cu sexually curious about somebody or they have an opportunity to have sex with someone and they won't get caught right away. But for women, it's very different. Uh, the statistics and the studies will tell you that they feel disconnected from their partner uh, where they are, they're missing something in their relationship. When I went undercover and met with a number of different women, not only online, but took, uh, took a step and went on three in-person person dates uh, with the with the goal of, of trying to uncover what they were really looking for outside of their relationship and what they really wanted was what they were getting at the beginning of their relationship they wanted the passion they wanted the desire they wanted to feel like women and not like wives or mothers they just wanted to feel feminine and alive again and their relationship wasn't doing that their husbands had become complacent and comfortable and they weren't putting the same type of effort in that they were at the very beginning but they didn't want to leave their marriage. They were still getting a lot of their core needs met there. There you go. They just wanted that, that side of passion that they weren't getting at home. 
What do you think? Do you think women are better at cheating? You mentioned men usually get caught uh, right off the bat. It seems, are women just better at detecting when a man's cheating or do women just do it better? Do we cheat better? Are we more <laughs> quiet about it, more sneaky? What do you think? I think women are better at it. Uh, I think men, a lot of men want to get caught. I think a lot of people want to get caught, um, especially in long-term long -term affairs turning into long-term relationships. You know, there, there's several types of cheating. When we talk about, there's, there's flings where you run off to Vegas with your buddies and you get trashed and you end up sleeping with that stripper that you met at the club. That's a fling. It didn't. It, it didn't have any emotional investment. Uh, then there's long-term affairs where you end up investing over time a combination of physical and emotional, and so those are damaging. Do sites like Ashley Madison provide that long-term affairs? Is that what we're turning to, or are they just a service for that? I think that everything's a service for that, whether it's Facebook, whether it's uh, even going back again to the old days of MySpace or Ashley Madison who specializes in uh, in affairs. Their tagline is life is short, have an affair. And in fact, if you up your membership to the right amount, they guarantee that you'll have one. Uh, oh, geez. So, right. What do you think? This has economic ramifications too. This is big business. Do you think uh, profiting from cheating is immoral or ingenious? <laughs> I think it's probably a combination of the two. Uh, the people who are who are bringing this technology out for people to use definitely are opportunists and capitalists. But if they don't do it, someone who's going to cheat, guess what? They're going to cheat. That's what they're going to do. There you so go. they may end up going to a website. They may end up going out with their friends to a bar. But if they have that motivation and they are going to succumb to temptation, they're just going to do that. In your article, which I read, it was very interesting. I encourage everyone to, to go out and read it. You mentioned that some women weren't even interested in going on dates. It was more about the cyber communication. It was more about the chatting online. Do you think that uh, the majority of people consider this cyber cheating to be real cheating at its core? I would think so. Anytime you're doing something in front uh, that's not in front of your significant other that you have to hide, whether that's money, whether that's emotion, whether that's something physical, yeah, that's infidelity. Uh, so it, yes, if you're if you're telling someone else what you want them to do to you sexually <laughs> and responding back to them, I guarantee that, that they're going to think that's cheating. Sure. You know, some people have even gone as far as to say that reading or watching movies like Fifty Shades of Grey is de facto cheating. I want to turn to that. That uh, film is taking <laughs> over. We've got huge sales of the book. The movie is going to be a smash hit. What do you think that says about the culture of America, Fifty Shades of Grey, the popularity of it all? I think it says a lot about what women feel that they're missing in relationships. And if you're a man out there listening, you don't have to agree with me. Just go ask your girl. She's going to tell you what she's missing if she's missing it. Uh, and if she's going to see Fifty Shades of Grey, you might want to take some notes. What that passion, think? that desire is what she's after. I think so, too. What do you think about the criticisms of the book and the movie by a lot of feminists out there saying that we're perpetuating uh, female sub submissiveness, that we're domestic violence, things like that. Do you think that there's any merit to those criticisms, those claims? I don't think so. Uh, firstly, when it comes to the, a real BDSM book, this, this book is not accurate for the BDSM lifestyle. I've done some light research into it, and it's, it's not a realistic portrayal of what uh, bondage or sadomasochism would be all about. Uh, either way, though, this is someone who is electing to participate. So this isn't domestic violence or abuse. This person's not being hurt against their will. They are volunteering for this type of activity, because I don't want to say treatment. They're, they're involved. Uh, so when you're an active participant, you're not a victim. I would agree with you. It's entertainment. Come on, let's just call it what it is. Everything doesn't have to be so politicized. My last question for you is kind of a cultural one. What do you think about marriage? Do you think that the idea of marriage in our popular culture right now is changing? Do people want to get married anymore if everyone's just having affairs at the end of the day? I think people are afraid, uh, especially when you talk about the millennial generation. They've watched a number of their parents' marriages end tragically, and they don't want to participate in that again. But marriage is really a combination of a spiritual and financial joining of, of two people where love already exists. So if you're looking for a marriage to create love where it's not, you're doing the wrong thing. And for families, I'm all about the, the American family, and I think a lot of our problems stem from the breakdown of the Amer American family. So I think marriage is still important. It's an important important institution. Thank you so much for being uh, here with me. I hope everyone will go read your numerous articles. They're so entertaining. I'd love to have you back anytime. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Coming up, when we talk about women's issues, you would think childbirth fits pretty narrowly into that category. Well, wait a minute. What about daddy? Time to woman up. Ha, we'll talk about it next. Stay with me.
But when it comes to e-cigs or vaping, most of us are in the dark. You've probably heard two different stories. Either it's perfectly harmless or it's worse than cigarettes. And my favorite line, not enough studies have been done. Johns Hopkins says they could be just as harmful as tobacco and they may expose users to high levels of formaldehyde. Great, could be, may expose. That sounds definitive. Well, either way, some states, including California, are looking to treat e-cigs like traditional tobacco products. That means no vaping in workplaces, schools, restaurants, etc. But when it comes to these vapey wonders, are they the lesser of two evils? Who knows? Let's ask San Diego City Councilman Mark Kersey. Thanks for being with me, Mark. Thanks for having me. So, Mark, what's the word? Should the law treat e-cigs like other tobacco products? I think so. I mean, really what we're trying to do is, is keep e-cigs out of the hands of kids it, while simultaneously giving responsible adults uh, the freedom to enjoy them responsibly. And so that balancing act is uh, something that we're able to do here in San Diego. And uh, I think that's probably what should be done in other jurisdictions as well. So what kind of regulations are we talking? Are we talking about just keeping them um, out of the workplaces, keeping them out of areas where you can't smoke, no longer can you vape either? Is that the plan? Exactly right. So we're essentially saying that places where you can't smoke, you shouldn't be able to vape. It's fine if employers or establishments want to create vaping only areas. Uh, that's okay because then you're giving customers or uh, you know employees the ability to do that in a segregated way that's uh, apart from the, the rest of the uh, uh, the people there. Uh, but really, you know, this is something that the long-term impacts are, are still to be determined. Uh, you know, th this right. is this is something we, we we really just from a public health standpoint uh, we have to focus on. Is secondhand vape a thing? What kind of fumes do you get off of someone that's, that's vaping? I personally haven't been around it very much, so I'm not sure. Well, you know, they're, they're chemicals. And uh, the, it's not just harmless water vapor, it is actually chemicals. And the, the, the range of chemicals, you know, varies depending on what brand you're talking about, where they're made. A lot of them are made in China uh, or other places in Asia. And so we don't know exactly what's in them in some cases. But in any event, it's not good for you. It, it, it's, I guess, perhaps debatable as to how bad it is for you, but it's clearly not good for you. And I mentioned the lesser of two evils. One of the big uh, pushes that they're making for e-cigs and for vaping is that it weans smokers off of traditional tobacco products that are more harmful. Do you think there's any truth to that, that they're vaping to get themselves off of smoking anything and that's just the next step in the progression? You know, there is some truth to that, uh, but it's all anecdotal evidence at this point. Uh, we had a number of people uh, come down to our city council hearing on this and, and say that they had used e-cigs to get off of regular cigarettes, and, and, and that's great, and, and I, I hope more people are able to do that. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's notable that the FDA has not approved uh, e-cigs as a smoking cessation device, despite having the opportunity to do that, uh, you know, such as the patch or, or the, uh, mm -hmm. the gum. So, uh, you know, anecdotally, maybe, but scientifically, no. This debate, too, I've heard a lot of people say it's just, as you mentioned before, harmless water vapor. It reminds me of the discussion around hookah, which a lot of young people, I know back in high school, a lot of my friends smoked hookah. They thought it was completely harmless. They thought it was just flavored. It was fun. Is that what we're going to see, too? We're already seeing it, uh, to be honest, with vaping and e-cigs. A lot of them are flavored. Do they encourage teens that wouldn't start smoking but would start vaping because they don't see it as harmful? And that's, yes, absolutely. And that's really our biggest concern here is that we've spent a lot of uh, time and, and money and resources convincing kids that cigarettes are bad for them. And now this is really, the e-cig e industry is kind of taking it in the opposite direction. And a lot of this uh, growth in the industry that you mentioned earlier uh, is coming from kids. And, you know, the, the CDC reported that uh, uh, e-cig usage among young adults and, and kids uh, is up 300 uh, percent. It's tripled uh, since uh, since 2011. And, and that's a that's a real concern. Uh, that That is something that uh, it's, it's really taken us backwards uh, from the message that we've been given to kids for the last number of years. I want to read a quote that I think is really interesting. It's from Representative St uh, Stephanie Coons. She's a Republican from Ohio, and she was talking about e-cigarettes, and they're talking about banning them, uh, similar to San Diego. She said, these things look like Sephora eyeliner, and they taste like Dr. Pepper. Do you think there's a push by the e-cig or the vaping industry to attract young people much the way they did with cigarettes, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, making them flavored, making them look cool so that we are enticed to use them? 
Well, I mean, I think those flavors are clearly designed to, to appeal to a broad audience. And, and unfortunately, given the stats that we've seen among uh, usage by kids, I, I think that that is working. Um, obviously, uh, uh, the extent to which that is their specific strategy, I can't say. But uh, that, that's a big concern. Because again, people over 18 can do what they want. They're not who I'm concerned about if they're doing it responsibly and they're not negatively impacting people around them. But you know, kids who are 12 or you know, uh, 14, you know, middle school, high school kids, uh, they don't really have the capacity to make these kind of decisions uh, w without their parents. And, and it's just not, it's not good when they're getting these kind of messages from the industry. I think too, when you're talking about banning them in certain places, it puts a stigma around them for young people. As you said, adults, they're, they're free to choose. I wanna move now to regulation. Do you think we should be taxing them the similar uh, sin tax like we do for tobacco, for alcohol, maybe regulate them a a little bit more cash in on this fledgling industry? Well, I don't know that that's necessary right now. Um, you know, our goal is not to destroy the industry, it's just to make them, uh, you know, responsible. So uh, wh whether we need to do that or not is, is not uh, really for me to say at the city level, but um, uh, certainly, you know, encouraging restrictions that keep them out of the hand of kids is really our goal. I think so too. Another thing I want to turn to, uh, another California issue, is marijuana legalization. Because I see a little bit of a contradiction here. We seem to be all for marijuana, legalizing marijuana. There's a big push in the state. We're the first state to legalize medical marijuana. But now we're going the other direction. We're saying that tobacco products and e-cigarettes were against those. Do you think there's any kind of a hypocrisy here or a contradiction between the two different kinds of smoking? Well, I don't think so, because if you look at uh, the, the, the states that have kind of gone in that direction with marijuana, uh, there are restrictions on age, when, when, the, the age at which people can buy them, just like there are with alcohol and cigarettes. So I, I think that restricting them based on age is entirely appropriate, and that's really what we're talking about with e-cigs. We're not trying in any way to ban them. Uh, clearly, this is something that some people enjoy, and, and some people say that they use it to quit cigarettes. That's great. Uh, we're just, again, trying to make sure that it's not done by kids. Right. I think creating that stigma there, too, I hate to say it because it's, it's business too, but you're right for, for kids to understand that they aren't harmless, that it's not just water vapor, to understand the context. And we still need to research these things a little bit more too, which I know they say it all the time, but it's important. Thank you so much for being with me and giving us some insight on e-cigs at the city level. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Next, fighting for the little guy or killing us softly. Yeah, union bosses put the big and big labor across the picket line with me. Next. The problem with attempting to impose gender equality with laws and mandates is that such policies often have unintended consequences that actually do the opposite of what reformers were trying to accomplish. Take maternity leave. It's a good idea with health benefits for mothers and babies. But it's not true that mandating leave saves women from making career sacrifices. Long maternity leaves mean women end up with less experience, weaker portfolios, and a smaller network. In an unexpected twist, in countries with generous leave policies, there are actually a lower proportion of female managers and CEOs than in the United States. Mandating generous maternity leave may actually prevent women from reaching the same heights as men in their careers. I've heard it so many times. The United States is the only developed country that doesn't guarantee paid leave. Blah, blah, wah, wah, wah. All right, we get it, point taken. Well, last month, President Obama pledged to make paid family leave a top priority. Apparently, it's more important than ISIS or national security, but oh well. He used his executive wand to give six weeks of paid sick leave to federal employees after the birth or adoption of a child. But states like California already have this. It's paid for by employees' payroll deductions. It's not that expensive, so I'm gonna let this one slide. But here in the Golden State, only 45% of workers know about the program, let alone take the leave. Why? Well, it's a competitive job market out there. Maybe it's the fear of missing out. Let's ask my friend, Democratic media strategist, Franco Ripple. Thanks for being with me again, Franco. Hey, Tommy, thanks for having me back. All right, Franco, a little birdie told me this issue is personal for you. Give us your take. Uh -huh. It is so personal. You know, you and I, Tommy, we talk about a lot of important issues of national importance on this great show, but this one is personal to me. And the reason is I have an eight-month-old son, and I will be the first to admit, I did not think a lot about these topics before I was a father. But now that I am, I think a lot about uh, how paid leave affects men and women both in the workplace. 
But I do want to correct a couple of things. Number one, this may be a top priority for the president, but it's not more important than combating ISIS. Uh, just recently, the president sent to Congress a new authorization for use of military force to combat ISIS for three years. So this is not more important, but it is a top priority. And the reason is, it is an economic priority. The president was right. This is not just a women's issue anymore. It affects men and women, and it's good for business. And I have a feeling we're going to talk about that assertion uh, in this oh, segment, right? Now. I am. And you know what, Franco? I want to tell you, first of all, it's not that I'm against this, because I don't really have a definitive opinion on this. I just like to look at it from all angles. And you mentioned it being good for business. Now, I'm not disagreeing with you, because a lot of the businesses surveyed that have it, that impose it on their own, say that they didn't really see an effect either way. It was good for mothers. It decreased the turnover rate. So that's all fine and dandy. What I want to discuss, though, is if it's so good for businesses, why do we need another government mandate? Why can't businesses implement it on their own if it's good for them at the end of the day? Well, sure. That's an important question to ask. And so what you have to consider is that businesses don't always do what is necessarily in their employees' best interest. They, they often try to do what's best for the business's bottom line. And, you know, usually that's, that's as it should be. But only 13% of uh, women in this country um, have access to paid leave. That is a staggeringly low number. It's one of the lowest in the world. It's certainly the lowest in the developed world. And so I think what we see is that it's one thing to offer tax incentives, uh, for example, to businesses, tax credits to uh, offer paid leave to their workers. But ask yourself this. Would you eat at a restaurant to which tax credits were offered for serving food in a clean environment cooked to the proper temperature? No, you wouldn't. You want to eat, eat in a restaurant that you know has regulations to make sure that those things are happening. And what we can tell you is that the Washington Post reported just recently 81 percent of people surveyed in a recent poll said they agree that workplace regulations, not incentives, not tax credits, but workplace regulations to promote paid leave would be a good thing. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm even against you on that. I, whoever, like I always say, it's my repetitive line. I think it's a state issue because I think there's variation between state to state. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about it being good for business. Now, companies like Google, um, other private companies offer great incentives for maternity leave long uh, past what they need to provide or what a lot of other businesses provide. But Companies like Google and Fortune 500 companies can afford to do so. But what about the mom and pop businesses that have maybe 51 employees, they're not very big, and they can't afford to pay a mother or have her out of work for that much time? They're losing an employee, they can't afford to hire someone in her place. What do people do in those situations? Well, that's also an excellent question because the reality is most people in America work in small businesses. Yes, we always look to Google and Apple and these major companies as uh, you know the examples to hold ourselves to in business, but most people work in small businesses. And so I think what you'll see happen as this legislation moves forward in Congress, um, as it's done before, and I'll get back to that in a second, as this moves through Congress, if it moves through Congress, I think what you'll see is a modification of it. If you look at the Family Medical Leave Act, or FMLA, which came out in the mm -hmm. 1990s, that guarantees 12 weeks of non-paid leave to employees who work at businesses with more than 50 employees. Right. I think what you would see is a modification of uh, this language to where there's a certain threshold that has to be met. because. You know, I work in a small business. I'm very fortunate. I had as much leave as I needed. I only used two weeks because I couldn't afford to take off more and be away uh, from that business. But I think you're going to see a certain threshold is going to have to be in place for that. And I'm so glad you brought that up because Franco, a Democrat and a Republican can agree on something. It's meeting in the middle. <laughs> Having a realistic threshold is important. One of the things that mentioned in the opening here is something that I, as a woman, am actually concerned about because I'm 22 years old. I'm single. I'm not married. I don't plan on having kids anytime soon, by the way. However, I wonder if something like this could backfire for women because businesses might not be as likely to hire women or men that are of that age because they're not going to want to provide this leave. Do you think that uh, there's any possibility of that backfiring on the very people it's intended to protect or serve? Oh, I don't think there's... Yeah, sorry, I'm having a little issue hearing you. Um, no, I, I don't think that uh, that would be a serious consideration. And I do want to mention one thing. You mentioned that this is more of a state's issue than a national issue. Keep in mind, only five states... Uh, currently offer some kind of mandated paid leave. States like California, Rhode mm -hmm. Island, New Jersey, only a few states do this. 45 of the 50 states don't. So we need some kind of a national standard to get the rest of the states uh, on track. 
Um, but as far as hurting women and being less competitive in the workplace, the truth is women are doing better in the workplace right now than men, not in pay equality, but in terms of getting more degrees, going to college more, getting getting their education, and then going in the workforce, um, I think that smart businesses will see that women are a real economic driver and a real asset to their businesses and will continue to hire them and will continue to do the right thing uh, and make sure that they're taking care of their employees. I think so. I think we've made great strides in this country as far as women in the workforce. That's what makes me nervous because other countries that do have a government regulated paid leave for long extended periods of time, as it mentioned in the clip there, they don't have as high levels of women in power positions. So that's my fear. But uh, I'm glad we could meet in the middle because we did meet in the middle. I agree that there might be some room for some type of regulation. Again, I'm more partial to it being a state's issue, but we were so close to almost agreeing on everything. So <laughs> it can be done. Congress, take note right here on On Point with Tommy Laren. Thank you, Frankel. It's always a pleasure to have you on with me. Still ahead, it's okay to fall from grace, but you better stick that landing. My final thoughts are coming up next. So stay right here with me. Thanks for hanging with me tonight. Welcome to my final thoughts. Let's talk about the media, shall we? Poor Brian Williams. The guy cannot catch a break. He misremembered that his helicopter was forced down after an RPG hit. Turns out he was on a completely different helicopter that arrived at the site later. He told this elaborate story several times over the past 12 years. Each time he embellished a bit more. Well, helicopter crew members called him on it, and now things aren't looking so great for Mr. Williams. Look, we all tell big fish stories once in a while. We might even misremember things. He's human. Problem is, once you spin a tail this many years in the making, you're not going to recover when crap hits the fan. Now, it's one thing to tell a little white lie, but it's another to showboat your valor as a journalist. Truth be told, Brian Williams was and still is an excellent TV journalist. But none of that matters anymore. Just ask Richard Nixon. People will quickly forget all of your accomplishments and talents when you royally mess up. Mr. Williams, your job is to seek the truth and report, to tell the story, not be the story. Why did he do it? My guess, ego. It's not enough to be credible, insightful, and genuine anymore. News, especially television news, has turned into some kind of twisted reality show. And it's a shame, it really is. Why, as news people, are we trying to keep up with the Kardashians? Let's leave that junk to them and stick to what we're good at. Tell it like it is. It might not be as entertaining as the stories we spin in our heads, but at the end of the day, pride comes before the fall. We're quick to jump all over folks like Brian Williams for their embellishments, but maybe we, the viewing public, are part of the problem. We want drama, flash, sparkle. Does the truth matter anymore? It's simple supply and demand economics. We get what we ask for. Now, I'm still a rookie at this game, but mark my words, I will never be anything but Tommy. People tell me all the time, look older, don't say you're only 22, your hair is too bright, your lips are too colorful, you should use slang terms on TV. Well, guess what? This is Tommy. I'm not gonna try to be like Megyn Kelly or Barbara Walters or anyone else because you know what? I wouldn't be happy that way. So my message for this week, it's really cliche. You ready? Be you. For God's sakes, be you. And be careful who you pretend to be. You might forget who you are. With that, it's been a great night. Thanks for spending with me. Reach out on Twitter and Instagram at Tommy Laren or email me directly at tommy.laren at onn.com. My whole be authentic mantra means that yes, I will email you back, my dear. Until next week, take care.